Uh, the next thing on our agenda is the solar farm update. We have uh, Regan with us today to do the presentation. Uh, and then I will go, we'll have questions and I'll go to you, Councillor Killitz, to put your revised motion on the floor for debate. So we'll start with you, Regan, go ahead. All right, all right. Give me a second here, I'll... Uh... Can everyone see my screen? We sure can. Okay. Uh, so this is a bit of an update on, on the solar farm. Um, just hang on a second. Okay, something's not working here. Bear with me a minute. Right now we see your slide number two. Right, okay. Yeah, just my notes aren't coming up now. Now they are. Okay. So we're not seeking or expecting a final decision on the solar farm today. We just uh, reached a, a critical stage on the design that will affect the information that we'll have available at the decision making in the future. The approved charter for the project, as well as ATCO's financial feasibility assessment and the 30% design were all based on, on an assumption for a commercial solar farm. And well, that's what we're calling option one in, in, in this presentation here today. Um, we, we've also been learning more about uh, the municipal own use generation, which we're calling option two. Uh, we'd like to do some due diligence on this option as well as a, an, an option for a hybrid solar farm or option three. What we're looking for is actually, it's the best design option at this stage that'll help us determine what the expected costs, revenue and benefits will be for all three of these, of these options. So I'll just, uh, so, go over the, the commercial solar farm. So at the 30% design, we had incorporated Fowler Way, uh, just to give you an awareness, Villeneuve Road uh, realignment is not included in this. The, the expectation is that Villeneuve Road will not be realigned until the, the site is actually uh, developed for urban development. So that'll be post solar farm. The solar farm is intended to be a temporary use of the land. Uh, the rated DC size of the solar farm is 15.1 megawatts DC, and the AC size is 14.4 megawatts AC. Uh, the projected first full year of production is 20,393 megawatt hours, which is uh, equivalent to about 2,832 homes, with each home consuming 600 kilowatt hours per month, or 7.2 megawatt hours per year. One of the compliance issues, uh, there, there's, there's, there's some different rules uh, based on, and, and different Different solar facilities have different rules based on their size. Rooftop solar is treated differently than, than micro generation, which is less than five megawatts in size. Uh, at, at the solar farm that we're talking about is a utility scale generation facility, which is larger than five megawatts. And there's, there's a number of different rules that come into play, in, including compliance with the Electrical Utilities, the Electric Utilities Act. Um, and there's a, there's a stipulation in here that a municipally owned generating unit, including those owned by a corporation controlled by the municipality, must be structured in a manner that prevents any tax advantage, subsidy or financing advantage or any other indirect benefit as a result of association with the municipality or subsidiary. So, so what they're saying is they, they, they want a level playing field, right? A, a, a private uh, generation facility would pay municipal taxes. And I, I'll, I'll just provide some of the examples of, of ways that we could subsidize or some of the subsidies that they could receive. Like if we, if we were not to charge a lease payment, basically provide free use of the land, That's, that would be considered a subsidy. Um, no municipal taxes for the solar farm would be considered a subsidy. Um, if we didn't charge for municipal administration over and above O&M, uh, like our, our legal costs, some of our, our finance costs, um, and I'm talking administration here, uh, offsite levies, which we're all aware is, is a big one for this project. Um, and then debt financing. If we were to use the city of St. Albert preferred debt rate, which has historically been 1% lower than the market debt rate, that, that would be considered a subsidy as well. These weren't included in the ATCO boost preliminary financial feasibility assessment. However, we did include them in, in our own cost benefit analysis when, when we presented this to council in August of 2022. And it is planned to include the above costs in the financial analysis uh, during phase three. I, I should also mention that with the wind down of the Alberta Capital Finance Authority, the financing costs for municipalities are, are, are now um, with Alberta Treasury is expected to be at market rates and about 1% higher than they were in the past. So, so we're expecting the financing costs for this project and actually all projects um, undertaken by municipalities across Alberta are going to be higher going forward. But it, in relation to this project, it, it's going to affect our project costs by increasing the financing costs. So. 
there's a there's another regulation called the payment in lieu of tax regulation and, and it defines the terms of a balancing pool payment that must be made to the Alberta electric system operator based on the net income of the generation entity. So this is specific to municipalities because we're exempt from paying provincial and, and federal taxes. Um, there is this special regulation that, that, that removes that exemption for a, for a generation entity of this size. So ATCO Boost did include a BPP equivalent to the provincial and federal taxes that would be owing on the, on, on the commercial solar farm. And that was based on the net revenue of the project based on their analysis. The legislation does not clearly state that a municipally controlled corporation is a requirement for a commercial solar farm. However, given these two requirements, the first requirement being that we must demonstrate that we're not subsidizing a commercial solar farm. And the second requirement is that we need to calculate the taxes payable for a commercial solar farm. Both of these would require a separate accounting. And it is expected that a separate legal entity would therefore be required for a commercial solar farm, which would be owned by the city of St. Albert. This legal entity would likely take the form of a municipal energy corporation or an MEC. And uh, an MEC, I, sh I should mention that an MEC for a commercial solar farm uh, only is expected to be less cumbersome than the larger scale MEC that has previously been presented to council. We do not expect that a dedicated board is required, nor do we expect that dedicated employees are required. Uh, if, if we're just looking at a solar farm only, the big decision is sort of the go-no decision that you, you're well aware of whether to go ahead. Uh, after that, there's going to be some finance administration, and there's there's not a lot of big decisions that, that are made once once the solar farm is actually constructed. It's, it's selling the electricity and, and then doing the accounting on that exercise. So. Uh, another thing that I just wanted to make everyone aware is, is, is grants. Uh, ATCO and Boost did not include an allowance for grants in their financial feasibility assessment, but they noted that would be part of phase three. We assumed 10% uh, for grants based, based on what we were seeing that was available uh, on the initial capital costs only in our cost benefit analysis in August. We've since been researching several grant programs and our PM is actually in the process of applying for a grant that we expect will offset some of the engineering costs for the project. Uh, it is possible that our total grant eligibility might actually be higher than 10%. And some of the early feedback is that our eligibility would be better if the application included more innovation. And, and of the three options that have been discussed, uh, the hybrid solar farm or option three actually appears to be the most innovative. So I'll talk a little bit about municipally owned, municipal owned use generation. So um, there's, a, there's actually a special piece of legislation uh, that provides some special exemptions for municipalities under the Electric Utilities Act. With municipal owned use generation, instead of selling the electricity to the power pool or, or through a PPA, the electricity is used to offset consumption at our own municipal facilities. There's no balancing pool payment, and there's no requirement for us to demonstrate that there's no subsidization. There's also no need for an MEC for the separate accounting. However, 100% of the electricity generated must be consumed at municipally owned or leased facilities during every settlement period. Um, and there's only five MOUG generation facilities in Alberta, and EPCOR ZL Smith Solar Farm is expected to become the sixth. So th there's some administration. I'll talk some of the challenges with MOUG. You have to prepare a compliance plan, and that goes to the market surveillance administrator. And you have to demonstrate that 100% of the electricity that's being produced is, is also being consumed. And uh, what that means is, I mean, solar farm is limited because it only produces electricity during daylight hours. And it produces most of that electricity during the summer months. The peak electricity is, is, is in the summer months with much less in, in the winter months. And this current settlement period is hourly. And there's also the possibility that, that may shift to 15 minute settlement intervals. We expect that the first year of production, as I said earlier, was 20,393 megawatt hours is what it's expected to be. And then it'll decline with, with degradation of the solar panels a little bit each year. Currently, the city of St. Albert consumes about 18,900 megawatt hours of electricity uh, from the grid at all of our facilities and sites. And the top five of those are Service Place, St. Albert Place, Fountain Park Pool, the Oakmont Reservoir, and Jerome McGinley Kinex Arena. So that's about the equivalent of 26, 25 homes. But... Uh, the, the time of use obviously does not line up. We, at least 2,600 megawatt hours of our consumption is for street lighting, which we can't use to offset the solar farm production uh, because of the time of use. As well, our existing rooftop solar production, as well as the service place solar, solar uh, the rooftop solar that's going in at service place, 
it'll coincide with the municipal own use solar farm production, and that'll further reduce our ability to offset our production with consumption. So our initial estimate is that an MOUG solar farm would need to be about one third the size of the project that's currently approved. And another thing that we just wanna make everyone aware of the environmental attributes, we're not clear on. The legislation is, is pretty strict on, on how we deal with the, the revenue from electricity generation. It's not clear whether we can sell the environmental attributes and still make, uh, make revenue on that. Um, all, all, the, all that the municipal own use regulation is clear on is that the electricity must be consumed at our municipal facilities. Um, so this is something that we need to investigate further. The hybrid solar farm, as I said before, it's a combination, two thirds commercial solar farm and one third municipal own use generation solar farm. It's expected to have the same economies of scale as the commercial solar farm. And it's expected to have the same tax advantages as the municipal own use solar farm, just for that one third portion. It's not clear yet whether Fortis will treat this as one or two interconnections. And, and that's part of the reason that we're favoring the hybrid solar option is, is, is so that we can find out whether, uh, whether our this would increase the project cost by about $800,000. Each inter interconnection, uh, we expect to cost $800,000 with Fortis. So whether they would treat this as one or two interconnections, we're viewing it as a, a single interconnection with two meters. But that's the reason that we want to go down the path with, uh, with the design and then with the application with Fortis to, to, to prove that out. So. What we expect it would look like, what ATCO's recommendation is, is, uh, is that the south array would be municipal own use generation. So that's the piece that's south of Fowler Way. And the two arrays that are north of Fowler Way would be commercial solar farm. This isn't locking us completely in. I mean, we, can, we expect we'll be able to change to municipal own use generation at a later design stage by eliminating the commercial solar farm portion. It's much easier to, to remove um, things that have been designed from the project than it is to add add uh, add scope to the project at a later date. So, so we favor hybrid solar farm over municipal own use generation for design at this time. Uh, we can also switch to the commercial solar farm at a later design stage by simplifying that interconnection to Fortis. Um, another, another thing that I mentioned, we could potentially phase this with, with the municipal own use generation first and the commercial solar farm later. However, this would add additional cost to the project because we expect that Fortis would definitely treat that as, as two separate interconnections. So next steps that we're looking at is environmental regulatory studies. Uh, those need to be completed for the AUC application and uh, ATCO will complete their 60% design. Uh, the phase two and three application will be submitted to Fortis and uh, we expect the phase three 90% technical memorandum will be pre presented to council in July of 2022. And the financial analysis as part of this, we're still planning to cover all the options, the commercial solar farm, municipal own use generation solar farm, and the hybrid solar farm, as well as other options, like a, a lease to a third party with possible partners, uh, develop the site as urban residential, develop the site as urban commercial, and develop the site as urban residential, so or urban industrial, sorry. So there's lots of options that we're going to be looking. What, what we're trying to, to achieve here is, is just choose a design um, that, that'll give us the answers that we need for, for all the options. Um, and and, and we, we feel that the hybrid is, is, is the best one for that purpose. So um, I guess, did anyone have any, any questions? I'm sure there will be. <laughs> <laughs> Ken's already got his hand up. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, just a great presentation. Thanks for uh, clarifying some of my initial questions that I had uh, when reading the backgrounder. And so um, can you, when we were going through some of the uh, limitations that were there under the uh, Electrical uh, Utilities Act, were we aware of this limitation? Was our ATCO and Boost, did they uh, provide that uh, information to us during their first presentation or is this entirely new? We were aware of some of the limitations, but not all of them. Um, ATCO took a look at our, our existing usage his historically and, and they thought that the, the number was about the same, well, it was about the same size, right? But but since that time, we've actually the rooftop solar has been added at uh, at Transit as well as at Jack Craft, which has reduced our, our overall consumption. But Adco was not aware of uh, that the time of use needed to match on an hourly basis, which has a big impact. So uh, so that was something that we were we were made aware of when we 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 met uh, with the MSA. So. So then just building on that, our current facilities that are uh, like uh, Jack Craft and, the, and uh, the other and service, 
were not impacted by this uh, uh, limitation then, correct? They're, they're not impacted by this limitation. No, rooftop solar is treated differently. This, this is because of the size, because, because the solar farm is, is, is expected to be greater, larger than five megawatts, there, there's different rules apply under the Electric Utilities Act. Um, and, uh, and, and this MOUG regulation is, is, a, is another exemption that, uh, that we can use for a facility of this size, for a generation facility of this size. So rooftop solar is treated differently. Thanks, I appreciate the clarification. And I thought that's what I heard. So in relation, when you come back with all of the different uh, analysis, will that also include the other piece that I was uh, looking at was just the uh, remediation cost for the Badger land. Is that factored into the financial analysis or is that separate? Because it was a separate motion arising out of the 30th of August. So the, the remediation study, well, is, is being done in parallel with this process. And that's being done by our, our environment group. Uh, the financial impact of that uh, remediation study uh, will will be included a, a, as part of this because that's that's the looking at the options for the other uses of the site, whether residential, commercial, or or industrial development. Uh, that that remedi those remediation costs are going to factor into into our costs to develop the site for urban development, which which are alternatives for the site that would exclude a solar farm. So, we we want we want to look at all potential uses for the site in in, in our in our final financial analysis that we'll present in July. So, so by uh, recommending option three, you're just saying that's just, you're looking at your best design. You're not gonna limit anything else. You're not gonna close off anything else. You're still gonna provide us with everything that we were looking for in phase three, plus what we're looking at maybe potentially um, getting a partner or looking at totally moving away and, and uh, looking at other uses for the land. That's all still gonna come forward. Uh, if we move to a one or two, uh, what do we not get that still, or we just limit our limit administration just to those two options or other, or other options? So if we were to choose uh, municipal own use generation, we would obviously have a scaled down design. And, and, that, and that would result in, in, in some of that design work being deferred to a later date, right? And, and it'll be at a timeline where, where it'll be at a critical stage. Like I, as I said earlier, it's much easier to delete uh, some of the design than it is to add additional uh, elements to, to the project, add, add additional scope in. So what, what the project as approved was a utility scale solar farm. Um, basically we don't want to want to ride three horses and so we're, we're trying to choose the horse in the middle because we can delete the commercial portion and and we can convert this over to municipal own use generation if that's the decision that that is made in in july or we can we can go the full commercial form and we can commercial solar farm we can simplify that interconnection with fortis at a later stage as well but if we were to go the commercial solar farm right now we we wouldn't be able to ask those those questions about municipal own use generation and uh Fortis, Fortis needs us to apply. It's a very formal process, and uh, we need to present a design that, and uh, in order in order for them to fully answer our questions. So, for them to fully consider municipal own use generation and hybrid, uh, we, we expect that we need to we need to do the design in this way. So. Yeah, I was going to ask. I've got uh, I've got my thing. <laughs> Sorry. I hit my, uh, my my one button there. Should know that uh, by now. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, and to members of council. I thought uh, I'd ask um, Regan to talk a little bit about uh, the difference between the feasibility. Talk a little bit about the financial analysis. Um, talking about a little bit about detailed design because each one of them is kind of unique upon themselves, and I just want to bring clarity to that. Okay, cool. Regan, do you have? Do you want to talk about that? Now, actually, that'd probably be good now. Might clarify some of the sure. questions and go forward. Uh, well, so the, the financial analysis. So ADCO is only going to be providing us the solar farm options as, as part of their analysis. That, that That's the scope that that's within their scope. The additional options that, that we're planning to provide. So whether it's urban urban development of the site, be it residential, commercial or, or industrial, we're going to have to develop those options in, internally. Um, there are some iterations on the commercial solar farm. Uh, that's a facility that could be shared with partners. The municipal own use generation portion, whether it's uh, whether it's 100% MOUG um, or whether it's e even uh, the hybrid, the municipal own use 
generation portion cannot be shared with other parties. It has to be 100% by owned by a municipality and it has to be within that mun the municipal boundary. So the, the legislation is very specific. Um, so we, we, we plan to present all of those options in, as part of the financial analysis, uh, but we need a design going forward to, to, get, us, to get us the answers to, to feed into that financial analysis. So uh, does that fully answer what you were asking, Carrie? Is there, is there? The better question would be, does that answer kind of provide yeah, no. council a little bit more clarity into that? Yeah, no, and I, I, I guess it just was, it sp speaks to one of my uh, questions and I thought it got answered in the uh, presentation because some of the limitations that would be tied to a commercial solar farm uh, that would be that it has to be outside of St. Albert's uh, control, but that would basically present an opportunity for a partner, correct? That, that, is, that is correct. Uh, of the solar farm options, the commercial solar farm option is the, is the only one. Uh, well, the hybrid, the commercial solar farm portion of the hybrid could also be shared. Um, so that would be another iteration. But those, those are iterations on the commercial solar farm. Okay. No, I just have, so, yeah, but I just want one question. Yeah, because that was what you and I were talking about. So uh, the commercial could be, we lease the land and let somebody else run it or we partner with somebody, whether it's 50-50 or 60-40, and we invest to that proportion and share revenue in that proportion. So that's part of the, that's the commercial. I would agree, Your Worship. Okay. Sorry, just making sure all options are public and that we understand. Keep going. Yeah, the last question then is, is so just to confirm, regardless of which option council approves today, we are not locked in to any decision right now. We, there's still several gates that are available to council to walk away. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Perfect. All right, Councillor Killick and then Councillor Hughes. Uh, thank you. For, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the background material that uh, was provided by Mr. Hiltz, uh, found it very helpful you know, from previous years of uh, council's decisions. So it gave me some good background. I'd just like to acknowledge that. Um, in terms of a question, does, does the Fowler Way uh, alignment give a nice physical separation between what would could be phase three as used by the municipal um, own use generation? as a full physical separation with its own inverter and connection over to Fortis? Uh, through the Charity Council of Kelly, it, it, it does, yes. Uh, we've got two arrays to the north of Fowler and, and one array to, to the south of Fowler. And, and does the array south, I, I still call it number three, I think, is that's the way it was labeled. Um, in its current configuration, is it below the five megawatts that gets us into all this complexity with other regulations with the Alberta Energy Corp, uh, uh, yeah, et cetera? Uh, I, I think it's close. So it, it, it would not take much to, 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 to get it under, I, I believe, if, if that answers the question. We, we could make modifications if, if we needed to, to get us under that five megawatt size. So. Thank you. And under that five megawatt size, then how much power would that produce? We, we would still be well within our limits of own use based on the numbers that you had just showed us in terms of the arenas and street lights, et cetera. So we expect it would be roughly one third. So it would be about 7,000 megawatt hours per year, which, which we expect we can, we can absorb hour for hour uh, at, at our municipal facilities. And could could you clarify for, for me the the way they measure that? I, I wasn't clear in terms of the peak is measured during the best case day in the summer, or not off, not measuring it at the winter, or when when does that peak? Uh, the, the, so, so, the, so the the peak is likely in the in the summer months, um, and I, I would guess at, at noon <laughs> during during a summer month. That that's going to be the challenge. We need to fully absorb um, that that peak generation at our facilities um, 
in, in, in the summer months. So, and, and that, that, that's going to be the challenge. That's an exercise that we're going to have to go through. We've, we've contacted Fortis and they're going to provide us with, uh, with hourly metering data at, at our larger facilities. We have interval meters at, at our, our larger sites currently. So, so they, they have historical data for the large facilities only. We don't have it at the smaller facilities. And um, that's the challenge is we expect that we're, we're not just going to have to be able to use um, that consumption and we, we have to demonstrate that we're using that consumption and we don't want to put hourly meters at, at all of our sites um, because there's going to be a cost associated with that. So we're looking to do it using the existing hourly meters at our, our large facilities. And uh, we're, we're expecting that we'll be able to fully be able to demonstrate that um, those large facilities are, are consuming all of the electricity that would be generated at a facility of this size. Um, but we need, we need some additional analysis and we need some additional data that uh, we expect will be provided by Fortis on that. Okay, but, but we feel like we're generally close in, in being able to- We, we do, we, 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 we do. And, and, and uh, we expect there will be some additional analysis though. And that's, we need that additional data from Fortis, but um, yeah, I just wanted, I guess, some confirmation from council that this is a path that we want to fully explore, right? Because we can stick with, with the commercial solar farm and have that as, as the only option. And that, that, was, that was the charter, but uh, administration just wants to look at these additional options and wants to fully explore them so that we can provide the full picture in July. So. Yeah. In terms of um, the power that would be generated, uh, do we... We know how much we pay, I assume, financially, uh, when we buy power. So we would have that as at least a baseline to say in our financial analysis, today we're paying for you know, $100,000 a month or whatever it is. Um, so we would have that data. You, you presented it to us in, in megawatts, I think, but we could translate that very simply into a budget dollar to help us understand the financial savings is that fair yes uh, yes we, we we can definitely show both um what, what the consumption is in kilowatt hours or megawatt hours and what that translates to um in, in terms of cost and there's there's going to be the energy cost and and there may be an impact on, on the dnt component so that the charges that we pay for this as well likely less so it, it, it's more the energy cost that we'd obviously be offsetting so um, the, the one that has come forward to me personally and a lot of uh, Facebook chat about power bills going up uh, in for residential. And, and when you look at the bill there, you have a cost for the power generated. And then there's the two other big costs that are um, transmission and distribution. If, if we were to pursue um, either of these options, in, including the uh, option to municipal own, do we get away from paying those uh, distribution costs or are they over and above uh, what we would pay in any case? We, we expect that there, there, there might be a slight reduction in the distribution and transmission costs, but, uh, but not a lot. Uh, the, the challenge is because our, our winter production is lower than our summer production, and our, our nighttime production is, is zero. Um, so in the middle of winter, we still need to get our electricity to the facilities and <laughs> at night. <laughs> and uh, those D&T charges are based on, on the average of, of the full year previous, right? So, so they're based on your peak usage in the previous year. So unless we're, we're able to dampen uh, our peak usage at those facilities, um, it's not going to have a big impact on the D&T charges. It'll, it'll, it'll offset the the energy charges or the, or the electricity charges, but less so the DNT charges. Uh, we, we, we'll have to do some analysis, but we, we expect that it'll, it would be a minor change, if any. So, Do, do we pay those uh, for our solar system on service, for example, where it's, you've mentioned that, do we pay those charges as well, even though the solar panels are directly on the building that uses the power? We still pay the DNT charges on those facilities, our electricity is, is only partially offset by the, by the rooftop solar at, at, at all three of our facilities, so. Okay, so we, we would still be connected to the grid at all time in any case for any other power that couldn't be generated by our own 
uh, solar farm. That is correct. Okay. It is, is there, um, there was some concern, and this, this uh, option too was, was in the ATCO report. So um, I appreciate it being in the background as well and discussing it here. So it's been a, a subject that's been under discussion for a while. Um, were, were some of the uh, negative points, I guess, about it, uh, have they subsequently changed for, uh, for site location, taking into account Fowler Way, uh, doing, uh, for example, doing the uh, connection over to Fortis? Uh, has has any of those things changed uh, recently? Uh, the the change incorporating Fowler was a change between uh, the phase one report and the phase two report. So um, I think mo the majority of the concerns that, that that we were hearing from residents is concerns about the potential costs and uh, and, and whether the costs would exceed the revenue for the facility. Um, and that's that's part of that financial analysis, right? Our, our initial financial analysis was that uh, no. It, uh, we, we've got the, the revenue exceeds the cost overall over the life of the project. Um, and uh, that, that's what we'll be, we'll be, we'll be looking to show in, in, in July. So now that we've got more detailed information and more, and more detailed design and, and we'll have better cost information for those interconnection fees, those are a substantial cost for the project, those interconnection fees. Um, with that information, we'll be able to, to have a better picture. The, the, on, the, on the cost and the revenue build, so. build on that interconnection fee um, with the location of the inverters all being very close to uh, the Fortis uh, substation which is optimal location um, the interconnection fee it, it came up in one of our other discussions where building uh, the underground power to your house at 200 amp but not spending the other money to upgrade your, your panel. The $200,000, uh, could, could that be minimized by building partially the, the real uh, hard to do parts and only um, connecting the inverters up if we were to build phase two and phase three? It's come up as a, as a big cost, but I wondered if there was a way to minimize those costs either through phasing it in or um, doing some of the heavy construction up front, but not the actual connectivity if we build it in phases. So our, our understanding is the 200,000 is, is just the application fees. Uh, there actually isn't any physical infrastructure that, that goes along with that. We, we expect that the interconnection fee, which is $800,000, will, will cover the upgrades that are needed at at uh, Fortis's site in order to accommodate uh, the solar farm interconnection. I ironically, we, we expect that if we were to phase it, they, they would have to separate it as two different upgrade projects. So if we went ahead with say one third of, of, of the project, they would have an $800,000 upgrade for that one third of the project. And then if we were to come come along five years later and say, now, now we've got another solar farm that we're gonna tie in, we expect that Fortis would charge us an additional $800,000. Um, what, what we're hoping is that if, 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 we, if we come forward with, with the two at the same time, the two thirds uh, commercial solar farm and the one third municipal own use generation, that it'll only be an $800,000 interconnection fee. Um, and, and, and they'll view them as two different metered solar farms, but one interconnection. But uh, we, we, need, we need to, I guess, uh, discuss that with Fortis. And, and to do that, we need to make a formal application, so. Okay. And if if we were to proceed with the smaller solar farm, does it have a the municipal one? Um, it, it seems to me that that is a more straightforward process overall. Uh, engineering design would it speed up our even even buying fewer panels so you know that we we could procure them faster? Uh, is there any um, other, shall we say, drawbacks to not, like I'm look, looking at it as a much simplified process to get to phase three costing or um, then to, to do the work internally and with, for, uh, and with ATCO to come up with a much simpler solution, show us that we've got a track record, that we can do this, we, can, we now would have 
full data on terms of um, how much power could be produced. It, are there any other advantages that you know we haven't discussed that could um, come forward as going through the uh, MOUG? Got to get a better name than that. Moog. <laughs> <laughs> Moog. <laughs> or Moog power plant. <laughs> So we, we do expect that the size, if, if we can get it under that five megawatts, uh, there, there is a slightly different process with AUC. So it, it, we expect a smoother pro process with AUC uh, to get the, that, that approval process. But if, if, if we come around and, and add, say, 10 megawatts uh, five years later, we're, we're, we're going to be ha having to go to AUC twice, right? So, so with, with, uh, with, with the smaller solar farm and then again, with the larger solar farm, so so we end up with, ironically, you, you end up with additional costs um, if, if you if you do split it into, into phases. Um, we expect municipal own use generation will have less administration costs because we can actually deal with our retailer to take care of 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 uh, assigning that uh, electricity consumption to our facilities, right? And we, we can task uh, whoever we choose to be our our uh, our retailer. Um, we, we, we can tell them, listen, we've got this, this many uh, megawatt hours of, of production and we need you to factor that into, uh, and we can get them to take care of the administration side of it um, and, and get them to do um, the analysis and the true up to, uh, to make sure that they're, they're incorporating that generation uh, in, into our consumption. So, whereas if we go with commercial, we're selling to the, to the, to the grid and we, we have to deal with that administration of dealing with the power pool ourselves. So um, we, we do expect that the administration will be less. The challenge with the hybrid is we're doing both. So we, we'd have to come up with the compliance plan for municipal own use generation. So the, from an administration perspective, long term, the hybrid is actually the worst um, because we'll have to, we're dealing with two different uh, way, ways, to, ways to deal with it. We'd have to deal with the municipal own use generation as well as we'd still, it'd probably take just as much um, administration to deal with the commercial solar farm, even though we're only selling two thirds of the electricity that we would under the full scale commercial farm uh, to the power pool or to a, through a PPA. In, in terms of the siting of the farm, my understanding is the lower um, part of Badger lands where phase three is, is being considered is the cleanest part of the land. And if we go into the other north part, that's where the salt contamination uh, from the snow field is and some contamination maybe from our other storage. So location three is actually the optimal cleanest location to, to start. That is correct. And, and if we decided to go with municipal own use generation, that would be an additional discussion, whether we would want to put that on the most contaminated site, which is the northern portion of the site, um, and, and we, we expect that, that that would, but there would be changes to go from the hybrid to the municipal own use generation, and that would be part of that discussion. Is uh, which one third of the site would would be the municipal own use generation? We've had some discussions internally, and we've had discussions with ATCO. ATCO is recommending that right now go with the, the southern array as the municipal own use generation, and we can look to change that if if we end up landing on municipal own use generation, then. Uh, we, we could look to shift it to the northern array for the municipal own use generation. So, the, the APCO study also, I think, said uh, they did propose this, and they said that it, it would be optimal to run it for two years um, to gather real live data. Is that still the current view? The, the time schedule has shifted significantly as we've gone through different iterations. So, is it two Was year? Sorry, was that in the phase one study or in the in the phase two study? Um, I think it was in the phase two study where they still rec still had a reference. I shouldn't say recommendation. They still had a referencing the the, the MOG <laughs> MOG uh, would run for two years uh, to gather real data and and financial information. I'd have to take that away. I'd have to go back and and and, and find that. Um, the, the, the phase two report, uh, recommended building everything all at once. They, they didn't recommend building it in phases, which was contemplated in the earlier study because of the cost. Um, and, and, and it actually isn't the construction cost. Solar farms are quite scalable. It's that interconnection fee, right? If you break it in, 
that what we were originally contemplating was actually three phases of construction. So, so constructing the arrays one at a time. And, uh, and there was a couple of reasons why, why ATCO recommended not doing that. And it's because the big one was the interconnection fees, right? Fortis would charge us for three separate interconnections in, in, in that. The other thing is we could end up with different technologies because the technologies are changing so quickly with solar. Uh, we could end up with slightly different panels. So that, that, that could increase our administration and O&M costs. But we're dealing with, we could be dealing with uh, different inverters and different panels and slightly different configurations. And, uh, and so we'd end up with uh, three separate solar farms and each of them are a little bit different, which, which means uh, we could have different suppliers and different sourcing. So it, for ease of administration long-term, as well as uh, for, to reduce the capital costs up front, they, they recommended um, building the solar farm in one phase. So would that not already be kind of baked into the cake in terms of we've got a solar farm on service with panels that were purchased two years ago and inverters and whatever we do here, it's going to be different in any case. So we're, we've got to be set up to manage that type of situation. To some extent, yes, uh, but the scale of the facility that we're dealing with here is a much larger scale than uh, than, than our current rooftop solar, right? Are, are there other, I know what's come up as potential negatives, but is there possible positives to doing it in phases? Like when we buy trucks, we don't buy them all at the same time. We buy them in rotation so that the, you know, one third of the trucks gets old and we replace it on a rotating basis. We do the maintenance at a different time. Um, that's an advantage in procurement to do it in phases versus buying it all at once and it all expires at once. So is, is the phased approach actually potentially have some advantages uh, like that? And, and even if we bought panels two, three years from now, to your point, they may be better quality than the ones we buy uh, today. It, it, would, could we look at it that way as well as a, an advantage as opposed to a disadvantage? To, to some extent, you could make a case. Um, but I think those, those interconnection fees, that $800,000 with each phase uh, dwarfs any, any potential advantages that you might have, right? The, the, the other thing to consider is the risk element too. And I know that's, that's something, this is, this is a big investment all at once. And, and you could, uh, by, by staggering the construction, you could offset some of that risk. But um, you know, you've, you've also got to think of the long, long term, it, we're, we'll likely decommission this facility all at once, right? So if we build it in three phases, then, then we'd be looking to decommission it in three phases. So, so we're, we're gonna have some, some costs on, on the other side of this solar farm as well, if we, if we build it in, in the three phases. So. Councillor Hill, there's a couple other councillors that are waiting to ask okay. questions. Can I I'll, let them come I'll, in? I'll come, come back, back if I have some yeah. questions, sure. but thank you very much for your answers. I really appreciate it. Uh, Councillor Hughes and then Councillor Romanski. Thank you. Hey, Regan, how you doing? Hello. Hi, um, this has been a very uh, refreshing conversation that we've been having today. Um, a couple of things. So with the proposal, are we looking at additional cost or is it all gonna be done in-house still? Through the chair to Councillor Hughes right now, we're not looking at additional costs. With the, with, and, and that's the reason that, that we were looking at just one design because if we were going to do three designs, we would have additional costs. So we're, we're trying to choose one design that'll get us all the answers and information that we need. Um, okay. But uh, we don't want to do three designs and make three separate applications to, to Fortis because we expect that that's going to have obviously additional design costs and additional application costs. So. Got it. Um, okay, so you also mentioned about how well, we've got obviously we've got cost increases to the solar panels right now. And also we are going to be looking at at least 1% higher on interest rates, just depending on what we had before. Have we done any back of the napkin numbers on um, whether or not this is even remotely viable? Um, because before it was that it was 2.6% interest rate. And then when I asked what would be the cost increase if it was a 1% incre increase, and basically the at that time when it was gonna be fully commercial, not including all the expenses that you've now listed recently, it was a $2.4 million expenses with a $2.4 million revenue, which basically means we'd make nothing. Um, so have we updated those numbers to even look to see if this is even worth continuing to pursue? 
We haven't in detail. Uh, ATCO has provided a, an, an update and they're still showing financial viability, but we haven't done our own cost benefit analysis internally. We're waiting until we get some better numbers on, think, on everything the across the board. The day, so. Councillor Hughes, is, to, is not to get mm -hmm. those financials and, and whether we're going to build or not, if it's sustainable, if it's not, it's going to make, that's not what we're asking today. Um, Regan needs to know of what options so he can go and do the work that you just asked about. Yeah, so, no, I was just trying to figure yeah. out if it's even worth continuing to go down this road at all. Um, because if it's going to show it's going to be a, a negative on the back of a napkin, the odds are that we're just wasting time. So that's why I was asking. So you haven't yet done that. We'll be doing that in the future. So the next steps, you said we're going to go to, um, for approval, AUC, I believe, or at the one of them to do the uh, next steps for the application. So if we do the next, what I was I'm wondering is we're going, we're saying we're not deciding. I understand this. Um, but we are now also submitting an application to do something. How much of the, are we in the glue to actually do that, that we're proposing without actually having the decision of whether or not it's a good idea? So we're, like, yeah, go ahead. So it, it's not it's not a single application and, and the Fortis applications will be first and then the AUC will come later. Um, but but it's 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 a it, there's there's stages to it just 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 like the way we we've, we've staged the project the, the 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 phase one phase two phase three that that, that actually aligns with uh, with the stages of of the Fortis applications so uh, they they expect that you're only going to have a thirty percent design to start with and you're going to have a sixty percent design and then a night and and they they expect that there's going to be some iterations along the way um, if there's a substantial change they they may tell us that that we need to restart our application so they're they're there, there may be additional costs if we were to uh, switch over to the municipal own use generation. Um, they, they might have us restart the application process. We don't expect that's the case with the hybrid, uh, but but it, it's possible. We, we expect it would be the case if it was the other way around. If we started with municipal own use generation and then we tried to make the solar farm larger, uh, we, we expect that we'd probably have to go back to the beginning and, uh, and start over with our application process with Fortis. So. So the cost to afford us, that's not the full 800,000, is it? Or is it, it, is it the, a lesser? It's, it's the 200,000 right now. And it's, 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 it's broken down. It's like 5,000 for the first application. And then I, and then, uh, uh, and then I think it's, uh, it's 20,000. And then like the, the applications start to get more expensive as, uh, as, as you get into the more detailed uh, designs that you're, that you're presenting as part of the application. So. So you're looking at bringing this back to us in July. Was that right? That's correct. Okay, so and I know you I know you had on the screen, but I didn't memorize it. So when in July, how far will we be in the application process? How much sunk cost money are we already in for? So I mean, so the budget that we, that we currently have today, um, I guess still, in the we, application yeah, process. In the application process, we, we, we won't have final approval from Fortis. We'll be, I, I want to say, maybe 60%, 70% of the, the way through the application process with Fortis. So so are we looking at like two, yeah. 100,000 out of the two? Or how far, how many of the application fees do you think will be it, in? It, it, it could well be in that order, but I I, I, I would hesitate to say, I, I don't know exactly. Um, okay. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. We're no. just looking, I'm just looking at ballparks here. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not here trying to catch anything, Regan. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. Um, okay, so I guess what happens if you come in in July and it looks like neither option is really viable in the end? Um, is there a opportunity to just put the bricks on everything and say we're well, we just withdrawing our application? That's that's how we're setting this up, yes. Okay, so, so the this, this next thing was, I know that you said the third is the most complicated, but I'm also looking at it like, I understand, I understand all your number ones and twos. I understand all the pros and cons on this, but you did say number one, there's gonna be all these additional costs involved between the taxes and the administration fees that we have to actually account for and can't just subsidize. If we do number Correct. three, we're gonna still have the majority of those costs. Like you're still gonna need an accountant and you're still gonna need legal, you're still gonna need those people to do it, but we will not even have the full generation to compensate for that. That is correct. So um, have we looked at even if that's viable? We haven't looked at even whether or not that's viable at all. Cause I'm just thinking if we can't make number one work, how can we show the viability of number three when we have less revenue, but probably similar expenses? We will have less taxes as well though, right? That's, that's but but yes, that that's part of the analysis. Uh, okay. But we, we won't have that provincial and, and federal tax payment to make with that municipal own use generation portion. 
I, I just feel like if we're doing it that way, it's makes it even less likely that we would show a positive number. Um, I mean, I can see the MO, uh, MOU and doing the one third. I mean, because you're actually because you're getting the detail uh, the rebates on retail, that it would make sense that you know we can probably show that it would break even on the one the five megawatts or less. But if we're doing it on the ten megawatts and the other, have we looked at that at all? Like whether or not this is even an option. No, I understand that you're bringing this forward this way so that we can explore both options and then make a decision going forward. That's the impression I'm getting from you is that we're we, like, let's put we, them both forward and yes. then make a decision. We did a back of envelope and mm -hmm. it's still too close too, too close to call, right? If, if if one of them was an obvious front runner, then, then that would be the recommendation for today. You know, keeping in mind that we could have additional design costs down the road, but right now we're, we're not, we're not seeing uh, a clear front runner. In in, ter in terms of uh, cost benefit overall for the project, right? Obviously, there's less revenue for the municipal own use generation, but there's there's less costs as well. So it, it's a scaled down version of the others. Uh, but in in terms of rate of returns, they're all tracking very close to the same. So, okay, um, just a couple more questions. I won't take up the whole uh, evening. Um, the Ray Gibbon Drive. You said that you did not account for the re realignment of Ray Gibbon Drive because it's a temporary project, but it's supposed to be like three decades long. And I believe Ray Gibbon's supposed to be done prior to that. So how do we put those two together and still um, not so include the costs? I, th I think you're meaning Fowler Way. Sorry, you know what I'm yeah, 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 you yeah. got it. Because Ray Gibbon drives outside of this. And then there's yeah. also, yeah, yeah. There's, there's Villeneuve Road as well, right? And okay. we're, we're anticipating that Villeneuve Road, that realignment would not occur within uh, un until the site is developed for urban development. So that would happen um, when that when that occurs. So when, when we after we decommission the solar farm, if the solar farm goes ahead, after we were to decommission the solar farm, then we would uh, realign Villeneuve to tie into Fowler through this property um, is, is what we're expecting. So, sorry, so would, that, the, the, would that delay the realignment of Villeneuve Road? Because we're looking at two to three decades here before we're planning to re decommission it. So my impression was that we were going to do the realignment for Villeneuve Road before that. I know this isn't your area, so it might be another person to answer, but would this delay this? Because I, I really thought that we were doing it before three decades from now. It uh, it, it could delay this. I, when we talked to transportation, that realignment of Villeneuve Road in this section was expected to happen in conjunction with the urbanization of, of this property. There is another connection. I think it's at, at Hogan. H Hogan's connecting to, to Fowler Way as well. So, so further to the east, there's an additional connection. Um, when... Uh, when the intersection of Fowler and Ray Gibbon is is is, is performed, uh, I, I expect what I've seen in the transportation master plan is Villeneuve Road will dead end, and the solar farm will actually it'll, it'll lead to the solar farm, and that's all, right? So we'll be the only customer on the end of Villeneuve Road is 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 what I'm seeing in the transportation master plan. But in the discussions that we had with our transportation group, um, Villeneuve Road at at this location will not connect um, with Fowler until the, until the site is urbanized. So. Okay, the dead ending of Fowler um, is brand new news Villeneuve. to me because I thought we were still connecting it and doing a roundabout, and we were for the emergency access to Villeneuve Airport, etc. So that's that's news. Not, not the master plans that I've seen. Uh, it, it connects to Fowler through, through this property in, in the long term. So okay, okay, I, I I don't know when that came about. The decommissioning costs are they going to be included in the July numbers? Because I don't believe that they have been in previous numbers, and they can be quite substantial. They were, so include, we to... they, they were included previously and they will be included in the, in the July numbers as well. There, there was a, the, the decommissioning cost was included. I believe it was 5%. So it was a, it was a substantial cost that mm -hmm. was included. Um, but I mean, it's a time value of money as well. But, uh, but th those decommissioning costs were, were included. Okay. And so the further approval, just so we got this clear, because I know that this is just, an exp this is basically like asking us to do an exploratory phase to figure out which option to use. The decision about whether we move forward with either option in any capacity or we just kill the project altogether will be occurring in July. Is that what I'm hearing correctly? That's what we're expecting with our current timelines. If ATCO runs into delays, if we run into, the, there could be delays that uh, that push us further out. But um, the schedule that we're working with right now, we're planning to come back to council in, in, in July. Yeah, and, uh, well, if you're late, you'll tell us. And, and, and if we run into another little issue like this, there, there could be something along the way. We might be back before council just 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 to like because we wanted to keep you guys aware of, of, of the progress that we're making on the project. Right. So if there's anything substantial, we considered this substantial enough that we brought it up to executive leadership and they thought it was appropriate uh, to share with council as well. So.
No, I'm, I'm finding these conversations quite refreshing in the past two weeks. So this is, I'm, I appreciate everything that you and, and Mr. Hiltz are bringing forward to council on the way it's being brought forward. Um, so, okay, so I had it and it left my brain. I'm going to let it go, Mayor Hearn, and if I think of it, I'll come back to you. Okay, yeah, that's it for now. Councilor Romanski, been waiting for quite a while, so I'll let, go ahead, Councilor Romanski, when you're ready. Thank you to the Mayor. Hello, Regan. Um, the questions I have are on the um, actual environmental impact. So say we took and used the parcel of land, the third of land in the top northern version that's the most contaminated. Have you factored into it the environmental part of the breakdown leakage that you get from solar panels and how they can contaminate groundwater? So if we're to put it in the cleanest area of the three parcels and we're going to be contaminating that land and then we have further contaminated land, will that be all in your presentation as well? Because that's very important. So the foundations for this, I guess, uh, I don't know, I, I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. And I think there's some folks here with environment that can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, what, what we're wanting through this this remediation plan is 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 to, is to is to determine what the cost would be and then and we're looking to a recommendation we expect that in conjunction with the solar farm if a solar farm were to go ahead there there could be some some cleanup costs maybe take away some, some of the surficial layer uh, because that's where we expect a lot of the salt contamination is likely in the first foot or two but we need to prove that out through some geotechnical testing uh, and, and we're hoping we're going to get better information as a result of that remediation plan as well as we'll have a better idea of what the costs are because that I think we had a 15 and a half million dollar cost for the remediation that was that was an estimate that was done years ago and it was based on residential use of the site and it was sort of a worst case scenario so so we need to prove out what those costs are and prove out um, how much remediation we're looking to do and the timing of the remediation uh, we're, we're looking to get all of that out, out of that remediation study. So, and, and um, I saw a thumbs up from Ryan Stovall. From, so I guess what you said, he agreed with. Okay. <laughs> so you would clean the lands first to possibly de uh, contaminate them again by having the solar panels there. De depending, de depending on what's, what's contained in that remediation plan, right? If, if we'll, look, we'll look at what the recommendations of that remediation plan are. So. Uh, okay, and then in the three in the three different levels, you had operational costs were more than three times in each section. So if you went to the MOUG, it wasn't uh, just the third of the operational costs of all three. Uh, it would have been higher to do three sections. So why would that be? I'm uh, sorry. What, what was what the were you operational to? costs? I saw were like I believe 120,000 versus 30,000. What page the, on, Councilor Romanski? I don't. I know. don't know what page it's on. Sorry, I don't have the this, report in front of me. Was, but it was, this, was, this was an ADCO's report. Yes, There's and it was more report. than so, more than three times of the operational cost. It was actually, you know, four times for the full scale facility. Sorry, yeah, there, correct. There are yes. Operational costs in in our in our agenda package. So I think you're confusing us, Council Romanski. Okay, I'll leave that question for now then. Um, okay, and the last or second last question is, it showed the inverters need to be replaced at 15 years. So have you put the cost of that into the projections as well? And because when you're finally seeing return, you're having to replace things already. And if the connect and if the technology is changing that quick, like you were saying, it wouldn't match having different panels um, when you're having to replace, isn't it good to cycle those anyhow, if you have to replace them every 15 years? Again, Councilor Bransky, the financials of A, B, and C options in front of us are not what we're talking about today. So Regan has not put those costs in because that will come in July. Right now, okay. we focus well, our questions on whether we want well, this commercial or municipally owned. I just need sure. to know if it will show the costs of, of replacement in the projections. Sure. I think I think part of the presentation today is a bit of education, I think, too, and, and getting everybody caught up. So, yes, in the original analysis that ADCO had done, they had included at 15 years that, that all of the in inverters would be replaced. Um, now, and, and you say there's there could be some positives, yes, to, to staggering that, but there's also some negatives, right? Because we could do a single procurement and take care of all the inverters at once. If we, if we stagger them by a couple of years, then we're looking at three different uh, phases. So it's... It's good and bad, and I, I would lean towards it's actually worse, right? I, I would sooner deal with a single procurement to take care of all the inverters all at once um, rather than do it in three separate phases. But um, there, there, there's there's pros and cons. So, 
Okay, and the decommissioning of the uh, project, that would just be projected because, of course, it should be quite a bit more expensive in the future to uh, get rid of waste, so right. to speak. Yeah. Right, I, I think the cost estimate was was 5% uh, in today's mm -hmm. dollars. So, so the, the original capital costs, we're expecting 5% of those costs. So. That's it, thank you. Perfect, all right. Uh... Anyone else have any further questions? All right, we're good. So I'm going to go to you, Councillor Killick. You, Mayor Hearn, uh, can I just ask one more question really quickly? This one. Yeah. Quick. I just, um, hi, Regan. Um, I just want to confirm that in July, the remediation study will be presented to us at the same time. Is that right? So we'll have everything basically in front of us in July? Yes, we will. Yeah, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have to defer that to uh, to Ryan. Uh, the, the remediation study might be earlier. Um, I, I will include the remediation study. The impacts, the, the, the cost impacts will be included in the financial analysis. Um, but if, if the remediation study is is, is done earlier, I, I, it could be presented earlier, but that, that's going to be up to our environment group. So. I'll just comment. I have Megan Myers, the manager of environment. She can give us a project status update. We are planning on track to align with Regan's update in July. Perfect. I just want to make sure we're going to have everything, so that way we have a, we're not pausing or waiting or hoping for something. We don't have it all. Just wait till you get it all. I guess so. Just want to double check on that. I know the public's very interested in this topic, so we want to make sure that they're assured that when we're getting what, so that there's no questions being asked. Thank you, Councillor Killett. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just last week, we had an update on the realignment of Villeneuve and um, how it would connect up to Fowler Way. And we were assured that the transportation master plan shows Villeneuve not dead ending at Hogan Road, but it actually shows it kind of arcing north up to Fowler Way. So I, I think this question was maybe asked once or twice, and it, it, it confused me when you gave the answer that it would dead end um, and wouldn't impact the potential site of, of uh, section three. I just like clarification on that. I, I don't know if uh, Mr. Schick, oh, there's Donnie. Go ahead, Donnie. Through the chair to Councillor Click, yeah, Mr. Shik can, couldn't join the meeting today. So if I can shed some light there, what we shared is it will dead end at Ray Gibbon, not at Hogan. Hogan will still have connection to Fowler and there's a roundabout that was showed that will connect to Fowler, which then connects to Ray, uh, Ray Gibbon. And then you can travel to Villeneuve Airport through that channel. What Reagan has mentioned in this presentation is the, there's another connection from Villeneuve to Fowler directly and there's a roundabout that's planned which will go through our badger lands. We don't need that connection until such time as an urbanization occurs. So we still have connection to Fowler through Hogan is what I'm trying to say. Will that clear the confusion there? Okay, you know, that's, that's good. But it, essentially what I'm hearing, just to make sure I got it right, is the change to Villeneuve would not have that, that curve going up to Fowler way would not happen for many years in the future. And it, it probably wouldn't happen until such times as, shall we say, the solar farm is built and, and even decommissioned. So we're out to 2045, something like that. More likely. And the, the reason behind is there's no demand for that road if a solar farm exists there, right? Until urbanization occurs. So that's the rationale behind it. If, if any analysis suggests that we need to put that road back in earlier than that, absolutely, we need to consider that as part of the solar farm discussion. Okay, thank you. In the thank good you. old days, Councilor Kellogg, we used to have placemats at our at our spots. Wes will remember, and it had the maps of the city. We should get we should get a map of the future transportation master plan in chamber so we can point to it all the time. <laughs> All right, uh, no more hands up. So uh, why don't, do you still want to make your motion as you had proposed it, amending it or do you want to go back to what's in our package? Or, okay, go ahead. Read it in as you would like it.
The motion we have in progress is not the one that Councillor Killick sent. I can read it just off my. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the, the first part of the motion is that it stays the same that administration uh, report entitled Solar Farm Update dated February 7th, 2022, be received for information. The second part is that council directs administration to focus on option number two discussed in the solar farm update for purposes of detailed design. Okay, I'm gonna split that motion so we can do the for information first. Is that what you were gonna do, Council Brennan? Because <laughs> we don't wanna turn down the information if we don't support your amendment. Okay, so why don't we split the motion? Uh, I'll accept the received as information piece of it and I'll let you have opening arguments if you want to speak to that piece of it or it's just it's just information you don't have to uh, just just to say I appreciate the uh, current update uh, the information received builds on the excellent work that was done uh, previously and it seems to flow together appreciate that it addresses three options for council's consideration and uh, the presentation answered a lot of questions. So uh, the uh, information as presented and follow up questions have been helpful and recommend we, we support that. Perfect. And I see no one else wanting to speak. So I'll call for the vote. Voting. Voting's closed and that passes unanimously. All right. Uh, Councilor Killick, your second piece of your motion is that we focus on option two. I'll, you read it, I'll accept it. So go into your opening arguments. Fred? You did. Yep. That's okay. It's on your I, screen. So that council directs administration to focus on option number two discussed in the solar farm update for purposes of detailed design. If you want to make an amendment. Okay, thank you for that. All right, go ahead, Councilor Killick. Thank you. So uh, again, going back to the information that we received and historical information, uh, it, in reviewing all of that, uh, it seemed to me that option two, the municipal owned use generation uh, was a simpler approach. We avoid, uh, number one, it's scaled down in the cost uh, it's scaled down in the complexity of doing it. It avoids uh, significant admin and legal costs going back uh, and negotiating different agreements with the Public Utilities Board and Alberta Electrical Board. We stay below that uh, five megawatt. We may actually uh, open ourselves up to a much easier grant uh, process like we did for uh, the solar panels on the top of uh, service place. Um, the land being separated by Fowler Way uh, looked to me to be a, a very easy uh, solution or, or actually supports a solution of building a um, option number two Moog uh, solution. Uh, the location of, of the physical infrastructure, the inverter, the size of the panels uh, generated. We looked at the numbers and Reagan, ha Reagan has confirmed that we could consume all of that power easily from the smaller uh, municipal owned approach. Uh, potentially we could move it to the, the most uh, polluted land <laughs> or, or toxic land. So it just seemed to me there are significant uh, own use benefits, uh, and it's a, a simpler solution to work through with ATCO. Uh, we could get it up and running potentially sooner, and we could start to see real, uh, real data as well as potentially real financial benefits uh, by offset by building something that essentially offsets our own uh, usage. We've had success in doing that by having solar panels on top of uh, transportation center and service. 
this is just a slightly uh, larger uh, proposal, but again, simplification, setting the team up for success, allowing us to move forward with real-time information and actually uh, addressing many of the questions that have been raised by residents in terms of, will this really make money? Uh, it, it eliminates our need to go out and get a PPA agreement to sell power to someone uh, yet to be determined. Um, we become our own customer and uh, it, it just seems to me a much simpler approach. So that's why I brought forward the motion to investigate option number two. It also simplifies admins uh, time and cost as focusing in on, in on a much simpler option and uh, recognizing that it, it could cost us a little bit more later on by adding to it. But uh, in, in project management history, uh, keeping it simple is uh, the key to success. It's a kind of a version of the KISS analogy. Keep it simple for success. And uh, that's why I brought forward the motion. Perfect. Thank you. I have Councillor Kai, Councillor Broadhead, then Councillor Hughes. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I'm not going to support this because uh, for all the reasons that were outlined by uh, Councillor Killick's opening comments, we can ach achieve all of those same things by sticking with uh, recommended option number three, because we're not making any decision points on any of those. The only thing we're being asked to make a decision on is whether or not we want option one, option two, or move towards option three. And even the administration identifies that option three, although somewhat more complex, will give us better information. And, I'm, uh, and then we can easily step back, and it's always easier to step back, and move back into option number two uh, once we learn more of the uh, details that uh, not only we were asking in our questions and were provided by uh, administration, but also addresses some of the concerns that were raised in Councillor Killick's opening comments, because those uh, types of decisions will only be informed by best information that we get by fully exploring all of our options and therefore allowing us to arrive at the best solution. And the best solution may be going back to number two, which we can do. It may be uh, determining uh, uh, what are other options that we have for going forward, such as uh, uh, involving a partner uh, that can maybe uh, help us deal with some of the, the hurdles that were identified, or we could look at even whether or not we wanna move forward with this because actually the, the dollars and cents don't make any sense. And so maybe we move and utilize uh, the land for other uh, needs, which were also being identified. So um, I just think it's a little premature to identify one particular option, particularly when we have administration's uh, recommendation that we move towards number three. And, uh, and once we get the information coming back to us in July, then we can make the, a, a more uh, informed decision. I just, don't wanna, I just don't wanna narrow us down in our scope just yet. Uh, when we have uh, potentially a more complete picture arriving at the end of July. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, appreciate uh, your perspective, Councillor Kellick. Uh, quite honestly, I think uh, you made some great points. Uh, I think you're making the debate though that we need to have in July. And, uh, and so what what I would like to have in order to make a wholesome decision around the whole solar farm issue is all the information that's available to us. And I think that's what's found in option three and uh, recognize that uh, in July, we may in fact want to uh, scale back to option or just the municipal owned uh, uh, utility or generation MOG or whatever we call it. We may want to step back to that. Uh, but I think uh, July is the time for that kind of debate to happen. Uh, so appreciate your perspective on this, um, but I'd kind of like the information. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hughes. Thanks. Um, I can see where you're coming from this, Councillor Killick, and, and I'm really not even sure how I'm gonna go on this. I might still support you. Um, the only reason why I would go with option three is just so that we have all the information so that it, we can at least exhaust this conversation. And 
and not um, have it just keep coming back and back. So that's the that's the only reason why I'd go with number three because it, it's it looks unlikely that this is going to make more money in option three than it will in option one. It will have less revenue and still the similar costs. If they don't think option one will work, I don't think a reduced plan is going to make it either. So um, option three basically involves a lot more risk. Uh, and and that's just something I don't necessarily think we need to go down to. It also it allows us, if we do just option two, to use the land for other purposes and only use the contaminated area and not the full uh, 80 acres, which has a huge value because we, we're sterilizing a larger portion of land that doesn't that does not contaminate it um, to do this. So I can see the value in just saying, look, the odds are number three is not going to work out and that really we're going to have to go back to number two or do nothing at all, depending on what comes in with even those numbers for the number two option. Uh, because yeah, I don't I don't know how, if, number, if we don't think it'll work on a commercial scale on its own, how it works on a smaller commercial scale. So I can see the rationale between just saying, let's just decrease the workload for staff. The only reason if, and I don't know how I'm going to vote, but the only reason why I would consider is just that everything's been put on the table so we can stop pursuing an option that really is unlikely to make us money, especially since the interest rates are changing and the costs have gone up, that it's unlikely it would make money even on the numbers from last year. And uh, moving forward, I think it's even less likely. So at some point you have to just, uh, you know, call a spade a shovel here. I'm not sure that this council will be satisfied until all the numbers are in front of them about the commercial to actually have it to a close. And so, um, I, I don't know. I may still support China because I think it makes a lot of sense, but I'm just not sure if this, if we didn't continue the whole thing, if it just would not, there'd just be a horse that just wouldn't die. That's about it. Thanks. All right. I see no one jumping into the debate circle. Councillor Killick, so I'll let you close. Thank you. My hope was that um, by simplifying and taking the simple approach, we would set the team up for a quicker path to success using solar generated energy. Uh, we're our own customer. We would save those dollars going out the door, uh, paid to uh, paid to APCOR. Um, we would know for sure that we're going to get a return on our investment. We are generating the power. We're using the power and we're saving those tax dollars being spent on paying an external power provider. Uh, we know that that is very simplistic math, uh, but it makes sense to me that we would pursue that as quickly as possible and get the numbers, get a solar farm built if our Drossen can do it and it makes sense to them. And they're a much smaller municipality. I know we've talked about that in previous councils as an example. It's working for them. I think this plan could work for us. It would demonstrate real numbers, real dollar values, real dollar saving. It would be a less expensive path forward, one, one third the cost roughly. And we could grow it as required um, into a commercial, potentially commercial, once uh, we see that. But this would demonstrate whether at its most simplistic, straightforward approach that solar energy works and can be either profitable or at least break even uh, and maybe a little bit profitable for our municipality. So my approach is that we do this. We don't do the, the, you know, death by a thousand cuts, make a project so complex, um, whether it's option one or option three, that we get um, into paralysis uh, analysis, analysis by paralysis scenario. We get so complex that we, we don't move forward. We have an opportunity to focus the team, look at a simplified solution, actually get something built, generating solar electricity that we use. 
and saving residents tax dollars instead of paying them out, buying power, we can generate our own. Uh, from that perspective, I think that's a first critical step. We actually get something going physically sooner than later. And uh, once we see that, we can actually start to build on it and look at the other pieces and see if those other steps um, might make any sense or, or not. Um, my, my strong belief is we should get going on something with real numbers. And that's why I brought option two forward uh, for council's consideration and to provide guidance to, uh, to administration. All right, call for the vote. Voting's closed and that motion failed uh, by majority with uh, Councillor Bermansky, Hughes and Killick in favor. All right, uh, Councillor Broadhead, I believe you indicated you would do um, another motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to bring forward uh, the administration's uh, recommendation. Oh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Yep. Okay. I move that council approves administration's choice to focus on option three discussed in the solar farm update for purposes of detailed design. Perfect. Let you go into opening comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, what's before us here today is, is around uh, designing a uh, a solar farm that will give us all the information that we need as a council to actually make an informed decision going forward. Actually, I loved your uh, debate, Councillor Killick, uh, going forward. I think there's, uh, there's merits to that. Uh, and I'm not sure what's gonna happen when we see it all together come, uh, come July. Um, I just think that at this point in time and uh, where we're going as a, uh, as a community and as a council, uh, we need to hear all of the information so that we can make an informed decision. I think a half a decision uh, to the point that uh, Councillor Hughes made earlier, if, if we don't answer those questions, they'll always be hanging out there. And, uh, and whether they're right or whether they're wrong, uh, there will always be open for debate. And I think if we get the whole uh, slate of information that's before us that takes in the account of all of the things that the administration had put forward today, I think that uh, we'll be able to uh, land on a course of action um, that satisfies at least most of us. Perfect. Anyone else on debate? Uh, I'll support you, Councillor Broadhead, and I wanted to see the commercial part remain mostly to address what Councillor Mackay had talked about and I mentioned earlier is the opportunity in Regan. It would be nice if we could even have an expression of interest if it's even out there yet um, to have somebody partner with us. You know, if you've got somebody like ACO or NMAX or somebody who's in the business willing to share in the risk and the revenue of this project, it kind of makes it seem more worthwhile. If we can't fund anyone, then maybe it's not worthwhile. So I'd like to see that presented in July, but that's only available if you do the commercial piece of it. So. Um, that's always been something I've been thinking about as an option for our council. So that's all I have. Anything to close, Councillor Broadhead? Oh, Councillor Hughes, sorry, go ahead. Oh, good. I'm hanging up on the way up high. It's hard to find it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to support this because I just feel like it's, unless we get that information, we're not going to have this come to a close and it will be a, a what if situation, as you said, Councillor Broadhead. Um, I'm skeptical about whether the commercial is viable, but willing to see those numbers. I think that the conversations that we've been having in recent weeks um, have been different than what I've had in the past. And I really have appreciated the, um, the level of disclosure. And so I feel more confident about what's gonna be brought forward by Regan and Mr. Hiltz and the team um, to help us make a decision. And I'm hoping like that if it, I'm expecting that if it is not showing it's viable that it will just flat out say, this is the numbers and it's not viable. If it is, show us the numbers and how, and, and we'll defend it and make that decision going forward. So um, that's what I'm, I'm expecting to see, so that way we can get it. And I'm glad that everything is gonna be coming to a head at least to get that information. So 
it's been a refreshing the past um, couple months to have these discussions about these different projects. And um, I am optimistic that we'll have enough data that will make a clear decision about what's best for St. Albert and what, how the best use is for this land going forward. Thank you. Councilor Broderick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, yeah, I too agree that this, uh, this last little bit has been very helpful. I, the interesting thing as well is that uh, additional information uh, that's gonna come in, in July is what the other options are for using the land. Uh, urban residential, urban commercial, urban industrial. Uh, and those are, those are considerations that we need to put up against the uh, solar farm and, and consider the whole thing. It may in fact be that uh, there are other options that will pay more back to the city. However, we've gone down this road because uh, we're an environmentally conscious community and we want to demonstrate that at the same time as uh, reaping uh, financial rewards for our community. So we'll see. And uh, in July, I'm really looking forward to the, 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 to the information and to the debate that occurs. It'll be interesting. Perfect. Thank you. All right, call for the vote. Voting is closed and that motion passes by majority with Councillor Vermansky and Councillor Kielik opposed. All right, then we need a break, it's 3.30. <laughs>